All right, so I'm doing a video about a presentation for KSP2, which includes a video I did about KSP2. What do you call that? Curbception? <laughs> Whatever you want to call it, let's do this. Hello everybody and welcome. So I've just returned from the Space Creator Day at the Technik Museum Speyer in Germany, where creative director Nate Simpson announced the upcoming version 0.20 dubbed for science for Kerbal Space Program 2. Yes, the exclamation mark is mandatory. In this video we're going to break down the announcement and everything I was able to figure out since then, and I will talk about why this update is pivotal for the future of KSP2. Before that, a quick announcement. I was able to do a sit-down interview with Nate during the event where he goes into a lot of detail how they have changed their development process and a bunch of other things that are very interesting. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you don't miss that when it is coming out. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about 9 things we were able to learn from the announcement. And I'll start with the final patch before science. Patch 0.15 will introduce a couple of fixes, performance improvements, this new grid fin part and an update to Unity 2022. This does not yet include a switch to Unity's high definition rendering pipeline though. That is planned for some time after the 4 science update. Patch 0.5 is the last scheduled release before the science update and is already out. You can see the patch notes on the forums and check them out over there. But now we get to the real meat and potatoes of the announcement. For science! There is a lot to talk about here. Let's start with… Exploration Mode. Kerbal Space Program 2 version 0.20 will introduce the so-called exploration mode. This appears to be very similar to science mode in the original, but Nate Simpson mentioned in his presentation that this will include resource collection and a feature they call delivery routes where players will be able to set up a resource gathering operation once and then the game will automate that going forward. We know that that feature is going to come because they announced that in the past already. But it sounds to me that sandbox mode will not receive resource collection at all, which would be a departure from how the original game has handled this. Then again, while you were only able to extract an unspecified ore in case P1, there are going to be multiple different resources in case P2, depending on which part you wish to construct or which type of fuel you want to produce. We will have to wait for the colony update, which will come sometime after for science, to really see how that resource system is going to behave. Speaking of colony update, there was this image that Nate shared during the presentation. It appears to show some orbital refueling station on the left and maybe an orbital shipyard on the right. The right thing appears to be a lot larger than the left, just scaled down to fit on that image. In order to do science, we need some equipment and other things, so we need to talk about science collection. The presentation and gameplay footage showed off a couple of new parts you will be able to use to gather science with. In this screenshot from the vehicle assembly building we can see 9 different science collectors. We got a camera with some additional sensors. Then there is this part which does something, probably. A sort of combo instrument, a scanning arm, apparently to analyze the soil as you can see with this little Duna rover. Then a radiation survey experiment which was also added to this jewel probe alongside this science package that includes a magnetometer. And then we have this cylindrical part, a peculiar sphere and this big glowing thing which has sparked a lot of speculation online what it might be, at least based on what we could see in the presentation. Now that we have clearer views on these screenshots, it's pretty sure that this is some sort of Kerbal greenhouse in space. Whatever it is, the fact that these experiments now have various different sizes and masses is going to make including them in a mission probably a lot tougher than before in KSP-1. We can also see Kerbals doing science. Here by taking a surface sample and this is probably the animation used for the EVA report. When you have gathered all of that science, what are you going to do with it? 
Well, the answer is you unlock the tech tree. Yes, just like with the original game, you will need to spend science points to unlock new parts and progress through the four tiers of technology. If you are familiar with KSP1, this probably will not offer any big surprises. It appears that the main thing they have changed is to paginate the tech tree to make the grouping of nodes a little bit easier. And apparently you need to unlock specific elements of the tech tree to advance to the next tier. It appears that the top lane is sort of the main progression to unlock every tier, while the nodes below them are there to enhance the experience of what you have unlocked in the main progression. The first tier appears to focus on exploring close to your home planet of Kerbin, while the following tiers appear to move further away, out into interplanetary space and maybe interstellar space later in tier 4. Aside from doing science experiments all over the place, there is going to be another way to get those science points. And that is Missions and Discovery. Yes, missions are making a comeback. Now we have Dr. Kerry Kerman here to tell us what is required of each mission. They can range from building a specific vehicle to exploring a new location. Apparently there are going to be missions that not only reward you with some science points, but also provide, and I quote, narrative excitement. While Nate Simpson said that, the presentation showed one of the moon arches which was revealed to contain some kind of map of the Kerbal solar system already a while ago. We know there are multiple easter eggs like this already in the game that hint at some kind of interplanetary or maybe interstellar mystery. I have made a full video on that, link is up top or in the video description, so if you don't want to find those yourselves, go check it out after this video. What is also new is the addition of so-called discoverables. It appears those are some special surface feature like this giant skeleton-like structure on lathe that was shown during the presentation. According to Nate, there are several dozen of these discoverables hidden in the system and finding them will yield additional science. Let's see who is going to find all of them first. But in order to get all of these new locations, you need to be able to plan your trip. And for this, Kerbal Space Program 2 version 0.20 will have a new Delta V calculator. The presentation showed the new and improved Delta V tool. It can now be set to either atmosphere or vacuum for each stage and also select a different celestial body for each stage to display the thrust to weight ratio for each. Say you plan a visit to Duna. With the upcoming update you can check your Delta V and thrust to weight ratio for the launch vehicle in Kerbin's atmosphere, then check your transfer stages numbers based on vacuum because it will already be in space, then check your lander's delta v and thrust to weight based on Duna's gravity and atmosphere so you can be sure you have enough power and fuel reserves so you can make the trip there and hopefully back. And after you have planned all of this and pressed launch, you can check your remaining burn time and thrust to weight ratio in real time on the right hand side in the staging menu. I really hope that thrust to weight will react to throttle input and display it corresponding to that. This is essential information when you want to set down your lander really gently or need to know if you even have enough power to be able to safely land at all. By the way, in the slide Nate shows here, you can see that there is still this annoying thing present where the launch clamps always want to be the first stage and don't get thrown together with the first engine added to the vehicle. This is something KSP1 has solved with one of the later updates and I really hope it will be added to KSP2 sooner than later, because it requires additional time to check your staging. Coming back to power in general, Nate Simpson also claimed a new update will make KSP2 have better performance. Yes, I know, we have heard that one a lot of times over the past few months. But what gives me hope is that they now finally seem to have cracked multi-core processing for certain parts of the simulation. Finally! Nate presented a benchmark graph of the original KSP2 code versus something new called SimTransform and there appears to be a significant uptick in performance. He also claimed that new terrain generation tweaks led to a 5x improvement in that specific area. All of these are big claims and we will need to verify them first when the For Science update will be available. Because let's face it, 
everyone can create a graph with a long bar and a shorter bar. I'm not saying that the developers want to mislead us or provide wrong information, but everyone's experience is different and each PC has a slightly different configuration. So there are going to be discrepancies between what was claimed and what users will be able to experience. How far these deviate is something we will have to judge once the update is released. And the announcement also promised something else that a lot of you have been asking for. No more wobbly rockets? On the left you can see a rocket built in the original early access release of KSP2. On the right you can see the same rocket built in For Science. Clearly it is not going to be very stable, right? And while it is a catastrophe from the start on the left side, you can see that the new and improved joint rigidity for the 0.20 update makes it a lot more tolerable. But if we remember the dev talk between Nate Simpson and engineer Dave Trugoning, also known as TriggerAU, a former KSP modder turned developer, they were contemplating multiple solutions. Is this now the final form of rocket rigidity? Well, not quite. Trigger said in the forums that they will have to review the solution implemented for for science as vehicles get bigger, probably alluding to how much larger interstellar spaceships will have to be to even be able to make the trip to another solar system. But as it stands, this will be a welcome improvement for most of the players right now. Speaking of welcome, the development team has welcomed a couple of new people which resulted in a graphics surprise. There were audible gasps in the audience when Nate Simpson announced that they had hired Blackrack, the developer of the fantastic KSP1 mod Scatterer and also a creator of volumetric clouds in KSP1. Apparently he has already been hard at work at how KSP2 renders atmospheres and some of that was visible in the presentation. This kind of falls in line with a years long tradition of Kerbal Space Program development. Instead of hiring some developer fresh from college who has no experience with the game, it's better to invite modders to contribute to it. They already know the foundations and can hit the ground running from day one. If we remember in the past, KSP1 added Rover Dude to the team, who was a prolific modder at the time and helped bring the resource collection and fuel generation system to the original game. Then there's also Trigger, who we already mentioned, and of course Chris Adderley, also known as Nertia, who joined the development team quite a while ago. So what does this all mean going forward? As many of you said in the comments under my video of the presentation, the upcoming For Science update might be the make or break point for Kerbal Space Program 2. When it releases sometime in December, the developers were not willing to be more specific, it will be 10 months after the initial early access release. The many game-breaking bugs, performance issues and lack of content have resulted in a lot of community backlash, but there has always remained a loyal fanbase that was willing to give KSP2 another shot if the developers addressed those issues. Based on all of your reactions to the presentation, it appears that for science is going to be a big step into the right direction. As I said to you guys who came for a chat during the Space Creator Day and later in the comments, Nate Simpson sold the new update very well. It is now up to the team to deliver on this promise. While the first release in February was quite a disappointment, the team has been trying to be more realistic with handling expectations for what the game will be able to deliver and the communication surrounding bug fixes has been pretty solid so far. Personally, I am very much looking forward to For Science because it will expand the possibilities of the game quite a lot. Now you have an actual purpose for going to different places and doing EVAs and whatnot. This has the potential to turn KSP2 from a wonky sandbox to an actual game. But as I said, it has to be solid. The quality has to be there from day one. Or at least a lot more bearable than it was back in February. Do you agree with this assessment or am I completely off my rocker? Does For Science restore your faith in the team? Or are you worried that this is all smoke and mirrors? Let me know in the comments below or head over to my Discord server where we have gathered a fine group of space enthusiasts and KSP fans and also the main developer of Juno New Origins. 
He has provided some great insights into challenges he and his team had to overcome to release their game, which by the way I also made a video about, link again up top or in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.